When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that would like to remind us all that the American dream is alive and well. Here is the captain. That's America, spelled with a capital M. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. You hear that sound and you know that I'm pouring a beer. You'll want to pour this one in a glass, my friends, and enjoy the beautiful amber color of Bulldog Amber Ale by the good folks over at Half Pints Brewing Company. The soft underlying hop bitterness in this beer is tempered with the flowery aroma of the UK Golding Hop. And I dig the nutty caramel malt flavor with this one. Garage grade three and a half bottle caps out of five. And here's some praise and thank you to our friends for helping us out with this week's beer run. First up, a big cheers to our friend Lisa Baird and Unadilla, New York. And a big We Like Your Jib goes out to Melissa B. in Graham, North Carolina. Go to TrueCrimeGarage.com. There's a little donate button on there. You can leave us a tip for some beer money, and that will help us fill up the fridge. Everyone we mentioned, that's what they did, and that's why we are thanking them. We don't just take this beer money and fill up our faces with beer. I mean, we do that, but we also donate to good organizations like Project Porchlight. And don't forget about NICMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children as well, Kevin. You're not only supporting the garage, but you're supporting other great causes. So make sure you do that. B-E-E-R-U-N. Beer Run. And make sure you go to our website and sign up on our mailing list so you're in the know about other projects we're working on. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. After the body of 15-year-old Carrie Brown was found, a brief press release was issued that read, Thompson Detachment located the body of 15-year-old Carrie Brown of Thompson at 2 p.m. October 18, 1986. The body was located in a wooded area on the outskirts of Thompson. Miss Brown was reported missing by her parents on October 17, 1986. Foul play is suspected and an investigation is continuing. Okay, yesterday, Captain, you had inquired about the location of where they found Carrie's body. As we have already covered, Carrie's friends all recall the town of Thompson to be safe and friendly. It was nothing for girls to walk at night, not alone, but no one questioned whether teens should be out at night. It was a safe place in 1986. And Carrie, as a rule, didn't walk much of anywhere alone, as we talked about in yesterday's trailer. A map was published by the Canadian Crimepedia 
that shows all of the points of interest in our case. So we have Doug's house where the party was, which is right on the northwestern edge of Thompson. Then we have Nicole's house, which is nearby. And by most accounts, I'm being told that this is about a two to three minute walk from Doug's to Nicole's house. The location where Carrie was found was not all that far away either, but was considered to be on the far outskirts of town. It was off of Mystery Lake Road, which was sort of a main drag within Thompson, but which turned into a two-lane rural road outside the city limits. Carrie Brown was found about one and a half kilometers north of the city. The horse stables where Donna and Joanne kept their horses was very nearby, of course. And Carrie was found on a dirt horse riding trail across Mystery Lake Road from Thompson Golf Club. All of the articles say that she was near the hydro line, which is the Canadian Power Company's electrical easement, and down a dead end road. It's a place one would almost certainly have to be local to know this spot, to know this area. And one could only get there by car. That's interesting to our story and of interest to our investigation because there were fresh tire tracks that were visible at the scene. Well, and going back to what our friend says, Nicole leaves the party. She sees footprints that lead down to some tire tracks. Well, and the interesting thing here too about this location where Carrie is eventually found is that from my understanding, this is kind of a, like a local teen hangout spot. So in fact, that same evening, the night that led up to Carrie going missing, and then we later find out she was killed that night, that same evening, Trevor and his friends we're actually debating where to go to meet up to drink beer. And that was one of the spots that they considered hanging out at near those horse stables. So that really echoes that idea that this is sort of a, a teen hangout area. Well, and think about that. Carrie's leaving this party. Some older teen says, maybe it's one, maybe it's two individuals. Maybe it's even more. Hey, we're going to go you know, just a block away or so and, and have a couple drinks there. You want to join us? And maybe she says, yes. Again, like I said, it wasn't a huge party. So we should be able to almost identify every individual that was at the party or around the party. But also we, we, we talked about teenagers walking in, in droves to this party. So is it po- It should be very possible for us to de- identify every vehicle there that was there that night. Exactly. And just staying with the idea of honing in on this area where her body was recovered from looking through my notes here, it says that the spot, the reason why teenagers would hang out there was that this spot was close to town, but it was also remote enough that there was little chance of being caught out there or found by your parents or discovered by nosy adults. So kids would hang out there and drink and party. But as we know, somehow Carrie Brown, 15 years old, ended up there dead. It's very shocking to me that there wasn't more rumors swirling around in this case because it was starts off, at, you know, the events start off at a high school party. Well, we did discuss the rumor that Carrie was found nude. That was a, a, and it's not correct. We just, we discussed what she was wearing when her body was recovered. That was just one of the rumors I'm guessing, but that's the one that was a strong enough rumor or repeated enough times that it made it all, it made its way all the way to us here over 30 years later. Regarding the investigation, you're exactly right, Captain. Like this, This is a rather large investigation in part that you're interviewing so many teenagers and so many people that were at that party that had come and go throughout the night, people that she went to school with, acquaintances, things like that. The case file is is large, is rather large in this because of the night in question. Now, speaking of the investigation, 
in the beginning, we have three lead investigators that will be working the case. So it's, it's three lead investigators from the RCMP. This was constables, Pat Cahill, Maggie Gregory, and polygraph and forensic examiner, John Tost. I'm guessing because of a lot of the stuff that you're, you are saying here, captain, and how this crime and how the disappearance is all described. My guess would be that when this team was assembled to head up the investigation, the murder investigation, that these three probably thought that this would be a pretty open and shut case, that they would be locking in on a suspect quickly and find evidence to back that up. Well, like we said, there was a decent amount of kids at this party. If you're law enforcement, you're thinking somebody heard something, saw something, or knows something. You would think so. And that's exactly where they start their investigation. They're going to round up everybody that was at that party that night. They're going to question them. They're going to go through Carrie's home and Carrie's bedroom. They, I guess she had her own phone and answering machine in her room. So they confiscated that so they could review the answering machine and the phone. They were looking into Carrie's family, her friends, her acquaintances, her teachers, really all the usual stuff that you would expect. The thing here, though, is Carrie has no enemies. Nobody could think of anybody that would want to do something terrible or to harm Carrie. And then on top of that, even with all these people that they talk to, there's no one that seems to have any clue as to what happened outside of Doug's house that night. And you were saying that Doug's mother was there, but sometimes when there's these get-togethers that other parents will stop by just to keep the parent, the chaperone company. Do we know if any other parents stopped by to hang out with Doug's mom? Because Doug's mom seemed to be upstairs the whole time. Maybe somebody would have, an adult would have seen something. From my understanding, and as it's reported, his mother sounds like she was the only adult. Well, we say only adult, but some of the kids themselves were adults because there were 18-year-olds at this this gathering as well. Well, let's dive into the information that we know about the crime scene. There's a good amount of information and a good amount of evidence that's going to be found at this crime scene or the murder scene. So the police, they gathered up all these bloody branches, which had sharp snapped off ends that were used to beat Carrie to death. So they have their murder weapon or weapons, as it were in this case. They have blood all over the ground under Carrie's body as well. So this led to the logical conclusion that Carrie had been killed where she was found. But the lack of mud on her clothing led to another conclusion, that she was almost certainly raped elsewhere, perhaps in a vehicle. Now, we know that the people that found her body described this area as as a muddy area. They're thinking that the lack of mud on her clothing means that the sexual assault took place at a different location and that she was then brought to the spot where she was killed with these branches. And the, that makes a lot of sense based off of the blood evidence, but also the branch evidence as well. There were some other weird things found at this uh, crime scene that could be or could not be of evidentiary value here to our investigators. So there was an air mattress and there was also a rubber car mat that were found on the muddy ground. This from the Thompson citizen website, it says a vehicle got stuck in the mud there and a blue and red air mattress and a black rubber floor mat were used to try and gain traction and extricate the vehicle. The air mattress had branches shoved under one end, which police believed were used behind the stuck tires to increase traction. Of course, the finding of a rubber floor mat seems like it would be a crucial clue, right? Yeah. That it might help you help one to lock in on the make and model of the car that was stuck in the mud. Yeah, that's a good point. And that air mattress, surely that could be connected to somebody. Definitely. This is one of those things where you wish that 
show these things to the public and ask the public for help. If you don't know something, ask anybody. Do do you know ask this somebody. air mattress? Do you know somebody that had an air mattress like this previously, but after the murder, they no longer have one? Well, the other problem though too is like you said, this is a local hangout for teens. And how many times have you been hanging out with one of your buddies and their dumbass gets stuck and you have to push or again, throw stuff under the tire to try to get traction. This could have nothing to do with the actual crime. You're exactly right. It's, it's one of those situations where it may have nothing to do with the crime or it may have everything to do with the crime. I can see, I could see someone going up there in the dark, unaware that, that it's muddy and that they might get stuck. So that's certainly a possibility, but so, but what a boner, the, the crime scene, it, it has a decent amount of, of possible evidence here. Right. Right. So we talked about the floor mat. We talked about the air mattress, but police also lifted some distinct shoe prints from that mud. Now photos have not been released publicly. Again, I don't know why we, we, Release things to the public and ask for help. But the Someone Knows Something podcast reported that there is one very clear print that looks as though the wearer of the shoe was pushing a vehicle. And they say this is because the toe impression is very strong with no heel mark. They believe that it's an Adidas basketball shoe. Adidas. The thing here that that I find of interest too, Captain, when we review things like this and statements like this that are coming from a crime scene, I hear that that people of expert level would consider this to give off the idea that somebody was pushing a vehicle. Whoever was wearing the shoe might have been pushing a vehicle trying to get it unstuck. Doesn't it make you think that probably two people were there? Like usually isn't somebody manning the, the steering wheel while somebody else is pushing the vehicle from behind. Yeah. And I don't know if you know this, I couldn't find this information. We said there's several branches that look like weapons that they use to beat carry. Do we know how many branches there were? I don't know how many branches they w- there were. And unfortunately, the RCMP has never released photos of any of the items that we've discussed. The, the mattress, the rubber floor mat, or the shoe prints. So, a- a- and in some ways, they won't even confirm whether they believe that these items are related or not to the crime. Well, and also... Local teen hangout. I know I'm going to keep hitting on this point, but if it was me and my friends and we know what happened that night, I wouldn't suspect one of my friends to come forward. Even if we had nothing to do with the murders, I I could see 16, 17, 18 year old. That's like, I don't want to come forward. I don't want to be questioned. You would probably be scared to death to go to law enforcement and say, that's my air mattress or that's my shoe print, but we had nothing to do with those murders. So like I was saying before, we have so many people at this party coming and going. We should have a witness and we, and we do have a witness. So what do they know? What did they see? Yeah, this is very important. We have a possible eyewitness here and police find a a person who says that they saw two vehicles leaving that area, the area where Carrie's body was found, leaving that area that night. They were were reportedly seen on the only road that goes into that area. So it makes sense that maybe they could be connected to this crime. The witness says that these vehicles, he saw two vehicles, and this would have been around midnight, which is... Somewhat interesting based off of the time of death as well, as reported by police. Now, it's totally unclear how reliable this sighting was because the witness, Sean Simmons, claimed both cars had their lights off when he saw them. So depending, Captain, on how dark it was out, his identification of the vehicles and the one driver that he reports could be doubtful. But anyway, what he says is that one car he saw was a 70s era 
green muscle car. And the other vehicle was a white van. And Simmons passenger, Larry Leapert, also saw the cars. So we have a, a second individual saying that he saw these vehicles as well. Apparently, one of the witnesses described the muscle car as two-tone, and the other one says that it was a solid color. So we do have some discrepancy in their in their eyewitness statements. But Simmons, our main guy here, tells the police that he got a good look at the driver of the muscle car. Do we have his description of that individual? Well, we might even have his name. So this is really weird because police... They, they hear the description of the vehicle and they're like, yeah, we know somebody in town that drives a car like that. And it's a, uh, a guy named Patrick Sumner who was 22 years old at the time. Now it's unclear to me, captain, how Sumner was identified, whether Simmons already knew him or whether police showed him a photo array and he picked him out. But Simmons told the CBC later that he's saying that he was 90% sure that it was Sumner that he saw out there that night, this Patrick Sumner guy. So he's not denying that he saw the eyewitness. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. I got no, he's, he's saying that he's 90% he's sure yeah. that Patrick Sumner is the same guy he saw out there. Yeah. Small town, unique car, hard to hide. But again, you have to go back to the idea that this is a hangout for local teens, and is it possible that there were people hanging out the night before the murder took place that have nothing to do with the crime? Well, and this looks like they're going to solve the crime, Captain, because they they go and find this Patrick Sumner guy within just days of the murder. He's now their prime suspect in the case. They interview him. He has no attorney present. He swears up and down, I have nothing to do with Carrie's murder. I I'm unclear whether he even knew her at all. There's nothing to suggest that he even knew who Carrie was, but they go ahead and they charge him anyway. You know how these high school parties were. You'd have some 15, 16, 17. I attended one yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, you'd be in the group of people I, that I hated at the high school party. At, at yesterday's high school party, I brought my motorcycle and I jumped a shark. And, um, I'm now like a local hero just so everybody knows. Well, I always thought it was strange and not to give ourselves away, but one of our buddies, grandma would go on vacation and we'd have parties at her house with, without any, any parents knowing. But I remember sometimes there being guys and girls in their early twenties at the party. And I always thought, what kind of loser are you? To show up, you have nothing better to do than to go hang out with a bunch of high schoolers at a high school party. But this is going to bring us to a three-day trial. Well, what it is, it's it's actually a preliminary hearing. Because what they need to do is they're still in the process of even seeing if there's enough evidence to take this thing to trial. Remember, he's denying that he has any involvement at all. And they decide to charge him anyway. So now we got to get a judge to sort this out to see if it's going to go to trial. So the evidence that the RCMP gathered and presented against Patrick Sumner at this three-day preliminary hearing was as follows. A spot on the interior light of Sumner's car appeared to be blood. Uh, item number two was blood stains were found on a T-shirt taken from a hamper in the Sumner home. So his home was searched and they obviously seized a few items. Tw right. Twelve hairs consistent with Carrie's hair were in Sumner's car on the seat. And a witness testified that Sumner was washing his car the following day after the murder. Uh, this was a local body shop owner and a used car salesman, Raleigh Becker who could see the dump. So this is going to sound very much like Stephen Avery making a murderer. Sumner lived at the town dump. It, the, the family's property was the, the town dump. And this, I'm sure he had a great high school experience living at the dump. Well, and this used car salesman said that, you know, I can see the property from my business. 
uh, where I work. And, and that is how I saw him washing his vehicle the following day. Now, by the time we get to this three day preliminary hearing, Sumner has an attorney. His attorney did a really good job making the court question whether there was any type of sufficient evidentiary connection between Sumner and the actual killing. Let's kind of combat some of that evidence, if you will. So the RCMP constable, John Tost, assumed that the stains on his mirror, on Sumner's vehicle's mirror, were blood, but they conduct tests, lab tests, and it was determined that the stains were not blood. We're not sure what the uh, the material actually was. Sumner did right. say that he believed it was tomato juice. It doesn't really matter what it was because it wasn't blood. Strange it would be tomato juice. I'd actually lean towards maybe the idea that it'd be transmission fluid, something that would be a darker red color. The small blood stains on the t-shirt. Oh, this is, I'm going to apologize in advance because it's going to get gross here for the next minute. Mm. The small blood stains on the t-shirt were the same type as Carrie's, but the shirt belonged to Sumner's father. So they find this item when they're searching the home, right? And they're like, oh, look, th this appears to be blood on a t-shirt. We better confiscate this. Well, very quickly, they learn the shirt does not belong to our suspect, just somebody else that lives in the home, his father. Yeah, but if <laughs> sometimes you take your father's clothes and wear them. Right. It was possible he would have access, Sumner would have access to be wearing this shirt. So here becomes the problem for their evidence with this shirt. Yes, the blood found on this t-shirt was the same blood type as Carrie's. That doesn't mean that it is Carrie's blood. It's just the same blood type. So it's possible that it was Carrie's blood on this shirt. If that's, if that's going to be the case, that's a big problem for this Patrick Sumner suspect. However, keep in mind, he's saying that shirt belongs to my father and the blood stains, the father says, were from zits on his dad's back. That's the gross part that we got to. Oh, that's uh, delicious. <laughs> yeah. So the delicious treat. Now, this this episode is sponsored by Dr. Pimple Popper. Wash your back, people. Um, the the blood that was found on the shirt was also consistent with the father's blood with Patrick Sumner's father's blood. So, so the story makes the sense. story makes sense. It could be his, his father's blood. Again, it's the same blood type. So then the, the other problem, but the other problem here is Patrick Sumner would have access to that shirt, but his father would have access to his son's car. Yes, he would. So but they, he's not seen at they the both scene. become no, which I understand. But what I'm saying is as far as the defense goes, you can start bringing up the fact that you can make a case that it's not Patrick, but the father. Now, what about these hair well, samples that they found in, in Patrick's car? As we know now, in 1986, it was thought of differently. But as we know now, hair analysis is not exact. The science on it is not exact. So all you can do is is compare two hairs and go, yeah, they're similar. You can't say that they came from the same person. There's Unless you're extracting DNA from those hairs and comparing it. That's the only way that you can determine that it came from your, the victim. So the, the hairs that were found in his car, they just simply cannot be 100% linked to carry. Now we don't have the smoking gun yet against Patrick, but we have evidence building. We'll get more into that after this quick beer break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. 
Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Major phone carriers make you sign contracts with rigid data plans to trap you into a kind of forced phonogamy. Sounds pretty insecure if you ask me. At Consumer Cellular, we believe in a more consensual and healthy form of phonogamy free of contracts and more flexible to your data needs. This way, you stick around not because we force you to with contracts and fees, but because you love our phone plans. Like ardently love our phone plans. Phonogamously. Consumer Cellular. When Freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Make sure you are following us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at True Crime Garage. Cheers, Captain. Cheers to you, Colonel. And then the item of Sumner washing his car. I mean, that's one of those things that I always kind of laugh at because some people will say that's evidence that somebody's trying to cover up a crime. Others say, look, it's just a guy washing his car. Sumner does give a statement at the hearing regarding washing his car. He says that there's a couple problems with the police's timeline here. He says, first of all, I'm a mechanic and I was in school all day on Friday. So I was not washing my car on Friday, the day after she was killed. I was washing my car on Saturday and I was washing my car on Saturday because I like to keep a clean car. And he also points out, he goes, he goes above and beyond here and points out, he's like, look, if I was trying to hide something, I wouldn't be washing my car at a location or in a place where many people could see me, not just this one witness. Right. Well, in, in Patrick's defense here, we said that it snowed. So at some point they're going to put salt down on the road. And a lot of people want to make sure, especially with these old type muscle cars that You want to get that salt off your car so it doesn't rust out. The long and short of it is that the crown did not present any other evidence against Sumner that we know of. We know that the judge dismissed the crown's case. This takes place in February of 1987 saying that there, the circumstantial evidence against Sumner was misinterpreted by the RCMP. And that the judge decided that there was actually insufficient evidence to keep Patrick Sumner over for a trial. Now, one thing that's difficult on our end here, Captain, as we try to report this the best that we can to everyone, the transcripts from this preliminary hearing have never been released. So we, we can't say if there was any other evidence against Sumner or anything else that really got him off completely because we just don't have that information has not been made public. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall during that trial and a fly on the wall during the conversations between Patrick and his lawyer. But now that was all taking place in 87. Like you said, she was raped. We should be able to test the semen the DNA of that scene. Well, so in the end, Sumner spent four and a half months in jail before this preliminary hearing took place, waiting to see if he would be tried. And of course, after they determined that there's going to be no trial, he's released. He says that he still suffers from PTSD to this day from being wrongfully accused. Well, that's a lot of time to spend in jail. If he, if he is innocent, That is a long time to spend in jail for a three-day preliminary hearing. Well, let's jump to this because you asked a a brilliant question here. And and knowing the details of the attack and knowing uh, what the victim 
in, in the crime scene and the crime itself, you ask a great question. Do we have any type of DNA? So Sumner is released. And really all that is, is like, Hey, you know, there's still some people that were suspicious of Sumner, even after he's released. And the judge says, there's not enough evidence here for a trial, obviously, but nothing really happens in the case for a long period of time. Now the, the police themselves, they try to ramp up the public's interest in the case and, and revisit media attention to the case on the five year anniversary of the unsolved murder, but nothing really happens until almost 10 years or a little more than 10 years later. This is in 1997 when just like the band, one of my favorite bands clutch says we got big news. This is when the Winnipeg sun reported on June 7th, 1997, that evidence from the scene has been stored over the years a recent breakthrough with DNA testing has put the case back on the front burner. Results from an Ottawa lab show at least two males are responsible. So there's DNA in the case. We sit here all these years later and we still do not know the source. It could have been from blood, could have been from semen. It could have been from material under Carrie's nails, touch DNA, touch DNA on items found at the scene. We just don't know where they got this DNA from. We can speculate. I don't think we need to. We know some details about the attack, but the, the key is here that they have DNA. This is what will solve this case or should solve the case soon. And hopefully it's solving the case soon. Now, what we can report is that Patrick Sumner, who spent four and a half months in jail awaiting a trial for the murder that he was accused of for the murder of Carrie Brown and then later released, that DNA does not match Patrick Sumner. So they've been able to test the DNA. It doesn't match him. But look, again, I feel bad for him, but he was identified by eyewitnesses. He was at least in that area the night of the crime. I guess. I I don't know how he was identified, right? Like that's the thing that always kind of puzzled me with this part of the story. It's like, well, it turns out not to be him. He could have been in the scene at the scene or near the scene, but he says he wasn't. And so, and then the DNA kind of backs up that he didn't, well, not kind of, it does back up that he's not the killer. And in this case, one of the two killers, but so he has really no reason to lie for, not being in the area, as he said. So I've always kind of wondered, like, is he just like this dude that the police knew and they say to the witness, like, yeah, we think we know who owns that car. And rather than showing him a photo lineup, do they just show a photo and say, was this the guy? And he's like, yeah, it looks like the guy. It wouldn't be the first time that that situation happened. Law enforcement does a lot of wrong things, but sometimes that's because they're human. Could you imagine going to this crime scene, seeing this 15 year old, girl beaten badly beaten and knowing that she was raped and then once you get the test results she's raped by multiple people now i want to throw out something there for you is because of this again we don't know how many branches but it is possible that there's more than two attackers just because we have seamen from two individuals this could have been a situation where there was a a gang well again we don't know where the the source of the dna But that's what I'm saying is like, just because we only have two sources doesn't mean that there was only two people involved. I would say the more people involved, the more likely that you're going to have somebody speaking or there's going to be more rumors or maybe more people that uh, didn't have a solid alibi for the night. And then we're going on 30 some years. Well, and a little follow-up to the information that came out in 97 about them having DNA in the case and that their words are results from an Ottawa lab show at least two males are responsible. So that that's their words, right? And we can only go off of off of that statement. But a little follow-up to that. This comes from the Thompson Citizen newspaper and it says Crime scene DNA samples gathered in 1986 came from at least two different men. DNA science was in its infancy in 1986. So much of the DNA evidence was reexamined and reanalyzed in the 90s. New DNA samples searching for matches have been taken, most voluntarily, 
some pursuant to court orders. What they're saying here, Captain, is that they either got a court order or people volunteer, vo- voluntarily let them take their DNA. This was from more than 100 people. So they've compared this to more than 100 people, and they've not found a match for either of the samples that were found at our crime scene. But you think they'd run this through the system to see if there's somebody in jail that matches this DNA? Uh, I, I'm guessing that their laws are a little different than ours. But you have to be hopeful that this case will be solved and it'll be solved by technology. Well, and whatever that they can do, I think it's safe to say that they have done. I mean, they're, they wouldn't be out there getting court orders for people to test and compare DNA if they have not already checked into whatever databases that are available to them at the time. And then like here, I know that with, when they check CODIS here, that CODIS is, is checked again in the state of Ohio every 30 days. This is very similar to like the John Bonet Ramsey case in the sense that you have a um, lead detective on that case that has a list of individuals that he thinks are responsible. And now they have a task force that is head, headed up by John Bonet's brother, half brother. And like you said, some of the individuals are volunteering their DNA willingly and others, they're getting it through court order or tactics like Oh, the guy was smoking and we collected some of his cigarettes. So I think this case will be solved. It'll just take time because, you know, with all your work with Project Porchlight, that these tests are not, you don't get there. It's not like a COVID test. You're not getting a result back in within a minute. Correct. And just because you get DNA doesn't mean that you're ever going to find a link to who it belongs to. I mean, there are many, many situations where a person or persons are not in any database out there. So, well, a lot of people talk and and I don't know if you know this, but I was reading about just some familial DNA test that can range from, you know, 5,000 to $20,000. So, it's these law enforcement agencies have budgets. They can only do so much. One article that was really interesting to me here, and this is honing in on a, what I would deem to be a drastic step that was taken by the RCMP. They mailed out letters to every resident that lives in Thompson. As we said, that's like 12,000 people. And they're asking for information, information specifically about Carrie Brown's case. A Thompson Citizen newspaper article from 2011 addressed some of the rumors surrounding what police were asking of the residents, what information they were seeking. It states that several witnesses reported seeing Carrie getting into a van between 10.30 p.m. and 11 p.m. Others say or others believe that she took a taxi. And then there's other people that say that she may have walked somewhere by herself from the party at Doug's house. So they're asking people, hey, residents of Thompson, do you know anything? Did you see a van? Did you see somebody in a van? Did you talk to somebody that has a story about a van and maybe Carrie or an unnamed girl? Did you do you have you heard any stories about a taxi cab or did anybody see anybody walking from that party? That's, I mean, I cannot think of a situation or a crime taking place here where every resident, every home is mailed a letter asking for information. But I'm hopeful, again, at least two individuals, and one of those individuals could be listening right now. This case will get solved. Carrie and her family will get justice. So sleep tight. Well, like we said here, Captain, a lot of work has been done in this case, and it's a decades-old case, several decades-old case. And to back up some of that statement, we have a CBC article by Bryce Hoy that addressed the huge case file. So a lot of work has been done, and it's reported that at one time, it was considered to be the largest unsolved cold case file in Manitoba. 
So it's 45 banker boxes that hold 14,000 or more documents and details about 2,500 witnesses. This would be people that they spoke to witnesses, friends, suspects, uh, and even investigators that were involved over the years. One thing that's key here with, with an investigation this large and a paper trail this large, and now we're talking about two perpetrators. And I believe the words were at least two males. So that, as you pointed right. out earlier, could mean even a higher number than two. But what's interesting here and almost bizarre, because you don't see this typically in these types of crimes, is that whoever did this or the persons responsible for this seem to have been remarkably good at keeping his mouth shut or their mouth shut. Yeah, and with the evidence, like you said, they have, think about the FBI shows you've watched with those those banker boxes. What did you say, 45 of them? Correct. That is a ton of information. It's very likely that law enforcement has inter- interviewed one, if not all, parties responsible for this murder. And then circling back to something that you had talked about and touched on briefly there, Captain, we need to make sure we point out this. There there was a very crucial line in a news story that came out not terribly long ago about this case that said that the RCMP have stated, have said that they sent the DNA extracted from the crime scene evidence to a private lab in the United States and that another lab is conducting the genetic genealogy portion of the process to build the family tree of whoever the DNA belongs to. Or in this case, it might be two family trees. What's weird is that is in a news article. However, we've talked about how tight lipped the police have been in this case and Carrie Brown's still unsolved murder. But the RCMP will not address this at all. Uh, So we don't have the confirmation from the RCMP that that is what is actually taking place. It's not clear to me how the newspaper, the uh, Thompson Citizen, came to this information. That is what they have reported. So I'm hoping, and I know you are hoping as well, Captain, that this is accurate information. Yeah, definitely. It would be a huge step in the right direction. One thing that is unfortunate is that the town of Thompson has had a significant uptick in crime since Carrie Brown was killed back in 1986. A 2021 news article on thompsoncitizen.net by a local journalism initiative reporter, Dave Baxter, He reported that, quote, over the last few decades, the city of Thompson has also become known for things far more sinister, crime, violence, and murder cases that have never been solved. The city has consistently ranked among the top communities in all of Canada for rates of violent crime per capita. The city's mayor, Colleen Smook, who has lived in Thompson for 43 years, said it bothers her and others in town that the community has become known for less than desirable reasons. But she also says there is more to those statistics, saying our crime numbers are high because they are based on a community of 13,500 people, while we are a hub for 55,000 people. And she goes on to say, when we look at the stats of actual crimes committed, most offenses are committed and happen to persons without a Thompson address. So that really is the crux of this case, in my opinion. The consensus seems to be that Carrie's case is different from those committed by drifters who pass through town. Most people in this case seem to think that Carrie likely got into a car with probably somebody she trusted and probably more than one person. And then she's found by the horse stables in this out of the way area by the horse stables known to locals. Her family says that Carrie had a major phobia of bridges and would refuse to cross them unless she was with someone who could comfort her. And I guess at one point in her lifetime, this phobia of bridges was so bad that when her family car 
would approach a bridge, she would get down on, get down low in the vehicle, almost to like not see going over the bridge. And what's interesting here is someone had to drive her across a large bridge on Mystery Lake Road over the burnt Wood River to get her to where her body was eventually found. And right. all of the information or the evidence that we're seeing at that crime scene is telling us that she very likely was killed where she was found. It also makes you wonder, was Carrie's murder an uptick in this community? Because one, the trauma that everybody would have felt growing up, even if you weren't at that party that night, you would have known somebody that was affected. Carrie's not the only victim here, her family, her friends, her classmates. So you have a type of trauma that goes through the community, but also you have a case that's not solved. Right. So does that open up Pandora's box for all the freaks and weirdos that go, hey, I could get away with this too? Well, and given the statements by the mayor and the uptick in crime and, and pointing out that a lot of that crime is coming from them being a hub rather than its actual citizens. I, you know, that still, it still remains a, a possibility that Carrie was the victim of a violent stranger on stranger abduction. Someone driving by happened to see her or she's out walking a couple blocks to her friend's house on her own and she's thrown into a vehicle. And I, and, and I, I think you could look at this and argue both arguments pretty easily here that it was, it had to be a local, had to be somebody that knew her. That's why she got in the car. That's why she was found where she was found. But then at the same time, you can say, well, they've already tested the DNA against over 100 people that their names were in that case file. And we've not found a match yet. So maybe it was some kind of random crime and a stranger on stranger crime. And as we know, as we, all we see, those are very hard to solve. Right Now, the RCMP will not confirm that they are using forensic genealogy in this case, in Carrie Brown's case, but let's all hope that they are, because after 36 years, it seems likely that that is the only way that this case will get solved. I want to thank you so much for joining us here in the garage. Thank you so much for telling a friend. I get an email at least every week that says, hey, I, I discovered your show because my buddy listens, and now I am hooked. And they go back to the beginning and listen from episode one till now, 600 and some episodes. We're getting close to 200 and some episodes on Off the Record, and you can find that at truecrimegarage.com as well. And you can also find recommended readings so colonel do we have any recommended readings this week? this week captain this is an oldie but a goodie this is one that we have definitely recommended before and i'm very happy to be recommending it again because a few weeks ago we were talking about serial killer kenneth mcduff and that inspired me to read for the third time who killed these girls which is a book about the yogurt shop the infamous austin texas yogurt shop murders case why am I recommending it again? Because it is absolutely one of the best true crime books ever written. One of these days, Captain, I'm going to come out with a list of the Colonel's top true crime books of all time, and this one will certainly be on there. You are going to want to check out Who Killed These Girls, Cold Case, The Yogurt Shop Murders by Beverly Lowry. You can find that great title and many more on our website's recommended page, truecrimegarage.com. That is a great idea for an episode. I'm going to hold you to that. Maybe we can do that by the end of the year. I would be interested to hear your top 10 list. Until next week, be good, be kind. And don't litter.
The Angie's List you know and trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today.